Wonderful. Okay, so we are going through this discussion about why Israel. Uh, we've been going through it for a couple of weeks. And um, today's uh, topic is We Three Kings, not of Orientar. Uh, Orientar. I was always, I was like, why did they have tar? You know, what's up with this Orientar? But whatever. No, it's not those three kings. The three kings, the first three kings of Israel. That's what we're going to look at. Uh, we're going through the scriptures and we're discussing the history, the archaeology, and the promises that have been given to Israel. And from this series, you will be equipped to answer any question when you, that you might be asked with regards to the historical, legal, biblical legitimacy of the modern state of Israel. And you will also know the plans that God still has for the nation of Israel. So we've looked now at the Abrahamic covenant. We looked at the Mosaic covenant. We looked at the allotment through uh, Joshua of the land, how he portioned out the land. We looked at the time of the judges and the ebb and the flow of the control over the land of Israel. And so now, today, we're going to look at the first three kings of Israel, Saul, David, and Shlomo, Solomon. All right, so Israel asks for a king. I always find it funny that Shlomo is the wisest man in the world. I mean, it just doesn't tra quite translate it into English. I think that's why we went with Solomon. Uh, Solomon the wise, but um, that's a whole other question. But let's look in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 3. First Samuel chapter eight, verse three. What we see is a, a picture of the last judge of Israel. This is Samuel. Talking of Samuel. He appointed his sons as judges, and the names of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second was Abijah, and they were judges in Beersheba. Here's verse 3. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but they turned aside after dishonest gain. They took brides, bribes, and they perverted justice. So this unfortunately shows that although Samuel had been a faithful judge of Israel. He was the last judge, and his sons did not follow in his footsteps. So the people come to Samuel, and they say, Listen, your sons are not following in your footsteps, so we want a king. So let's keep reading. Verse 4, Then all of the elders of Israel gathered together, and they came to Samuel at Ramah. Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you have grown old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us, like all the other nations. But the matter was displeasing in Samuel's eyes when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to Adonai, and Adonai said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but rather they have rejected me from being king over them. Like all the deeds that they have done since the day that I brought them out of the Egypt to this day, forsaking me and worshipping other gods, so they are doing to you also. And that's kind of the, it's like the, the next best thing is a king. Or next worst thing, you could say. And there we see Israel demanding a king. God tells Samuel that he should appoint a king over the people. And that the people have done this simply because they've rejected the Lord as their king. And that, that Samuel was supposed to warn them of exactly what a king was going to cost them. You've got to understand, up to this time, for almost several hundred years, said no taxes. No taxes. Zero taxes. Can you imagine how much wealth you could create if you had 30% extra of your money back in your pocket? No tax. Yeah, woohoo! I mean, no taxes. Literally, the defense of Israel, God took that on himself. If they obeyed God, then he defended them. If he, they didn't, then he didn't defend them. And we see this, that they reject God because they want a human leader. 
They want a human leader. They want to have a king. The people still demand to have a king, even after Solomon warns. Oh, sorry, Solomon. After Samuel warns them, he's gonna he's gonna take the best of your sons for his army. He's gonna take a lot of your fields, any field that he likes. He's gonna take it because that's a nice field. I'm gonna take that one. He's going to tax you, and you're going to have to. He's gonna set up rules, and then he's gonna judge you by those rules, and not necessarily live by them himself, because he's gonna be king. It's nice to be king. But the people still ask for a king. They asked for a king. So even after all that, they ask for a king. And so then God leads Samuel on a journey, leads him to a man whose name means asked for. So he goes, finds this guy by the name of asked for and says, you've been asked for as king of Israel. His name is Saul. Saul means asked for, and he anoints him as king. All right, so this is what happens. Okay, fine. Well, now one of the first, is, yeah, it's great to be king, but he's not a very rich king, right? He's a new king. There's, no taxes have been levied just yet, so he goes back home. <laughs> it's like, what do you do if you're king and you don't have a palace and you don't have an army? And it's like, great, I don't even have a crown, you know? So he went back home. Okay, fine. And then there was this battle. The first official act as king was Saul had to rally the people to fight. So let's go to this next picture. The story, is, the story goes like this. Uh, this is a picture. Ramah Gilead, or Jabesh Gilead, sorry. Jabesh Gilead is over on the east side of the Jordan. Uh, that's the little red dot over to the, the top right-hand side. That little red dot up there. And basically, the, the king of Ammon, so Ammon's down there to the south in yellow, and you can see the little blue line that kind of squiggles up there. He takes his army up there to Jabesh Gilead, and he says to the people up there, listen, I'm going to destroy your city. But if I feel like a really nice guy, and you surrender, then I'm going to gouge out all your right eyes. <laughs> it's like, what an offer. Or I'm going to kill you, or I'm going to gouge out your eye. I'm like, ow, no. Uh, and they said, listen, can you at least, at least let us see if we can gather an army, and then we could fight? He's like, sure, whatever. I don't know, some, some, some general, you know, bad tactics. If somebody says, can we gather an army to fight, you should always say no. Be like, no, I'm going to kill you now when you don't have an army. But no, he, you know, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And so they sent out messengers to see if they could rally an army. And then they said, listen, if we give us seven days and we'll send out these messengers, and if they, we don't have an army in seven days, then you can come and gouge out our eyeballs. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So they sent messages, and, and Sam, uh, Saul is all the way down on the bottom left, the little dot down to the bottom left. You need to get one of those little laser pointers. I think that's the, the next purchase for the congregation, a little laser pointer um, with all these things. So down at the, the bottom left, he's down sitting there, and he hears this. So Saul hears this finally. And what's interesting about this, we know that the messengers arrive at Gibeah and Saul hears that the Ammonites are threatening to gouge out all the eyeballs. And in 1 Samuel 11 verse 6, it says it this way. It says that the Ruach of God suddenly rushed upon Saul when he heard these words and his anger blazed. I love that. His anger blazed. I think in the Hebrew it's his nostrils flared. There's this... You're not, when you're angry, I don't know if you've ever noticed that. You've seen the pictures of, of horses when they're angry and the, or bulls when their nostrils flare, but humans do it too. His anger flared. The Spirit of God came upon him. And so he sent messengers all the way up through Israel, and he said this. He basically said, you are going to fight for me or I am going to kill all your animals. Because I'm a nice king as well. He's also a nice king. But at least he wasn't promising to gouge out eyeballs and stuff. So all of a sudden, he had an army. 30,000 from Judah and 300,000 from, uh, from Israel. I guess the people believed him. <laughs> and they gathered together 330,000 strong. Uh, what I find is interesting in this is that they're already making a distinction between Israel and Judah. Already this early in the piece. Uh, it's almost like this, fore, this foreshadowing of what's going to come in the divided kingdom, which is, is later after Solomon. 
But Saul then crosses over the east side of the Jordan. He surprises Nahash and his forces, and he saves Jabesh Gilead. Now, the reason I detail this particular fight is that it is important to see what the borders were at the time, or at that time. Well, notice that both sides of the borders were controlled by Israel, the borders of the Jordan River. Both sides of the Jordan River were fully under Israel's control. Uh, do we have another picture? What's the next one? Whoop, what happened? I think the next one is the scripture. All right, so let's just go back to the previous one with the, uh, the map. There is another picture a little bit later. And so both sides of the Jordan were controlled by Israel at the time. And Ammon, who is a little further inland, they just wanted to have some more territory, and so they wanted, they were picking a fight. And Saul's first act was to save them. And after that, he all of a sudden had a standing army. It's like, yep, I'll take your names down on a list. Next time I need to call up some reserves, guess whose names are going to be on that list? That's 330,000 strong. That sounds pretty good. So Saul goes through. He eventually fights quite a few battles. You know, he becomes king, established as king. We know a lot of the battles against the Philistines. Uh, he's got constant battles against the Philistines. He was called by God to attack the Amalekites. Uh, didn't do such a great job with that. You might remember the attack of the Amalekites. That was the time when he only kind of did a half job. He didn't complete the job. Uh, God had actually commanded him to put the ban on the Amalekites, which was to literally wipe them out. Men, women, children, and animals. Everything gone. And so when he, when, when he comes back and the animals are still alive and King Agag is still alive, Saul is like, well, why did, you know, half obedience is not obedience, right? Samuel, thank you. Samuel says, what is this bleeding I hear to King Saul? And he says, oh, well, the people wanted to save the best of the animals to sacrifice to God. And you hear the famous passage, is God more concerned with sacrifice or with obedience? All right. The reason why God had this thing against the Amalekites is because when Israel was coming through the, the territory up with Moses, God says in Deuteronomy, Remember what, the, what Amalek did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. How he happened upon you along the way and attacked those among you in the rear, all of the stragglers behind you, when you were tired and weary. He did not fear God. Now, when Adonai your God grants you rest from all your enemies surrounding you in the land that Adonai your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess... You are to blot out the memory of Amalek from under the heavens. Do not forget. So this was a, a commandment that God had given to Moses that when Israel was established in the land, they were to blot out the memory of Amalek. Now, by the time that Saul died by the hand of the Philistines, the kingdom of Israel is shown here. Ready? Yeah, there we go. So all of the yellow... I know that's kind of hard. Not the Arabian desert, but the yellow in between the green. The green on the left was Philistia. The green uh, on the right was Ammon, Moab, and then down south was Amalek. You've got Aram, which is up to the north. That's really Syria, or turns into Syria. And then Tyre. You can see they didn't quite make it up to Tyre. But from Dan to Beersheba, Beersheba is just a little further south of where Amalek. You'll hear from Dan to Beersheba a lot. That was considered the whole of Israel, Dan to Beersheba. But all of the area in yellow is what King Saul had conquered. Now let's talk about the house of David. The house of David. Just as Saul had been selected from very humble beginnings, so also was David. The difference is David didn't forget his humble beginnings, whereas Saul seems to have done that. David remained thankful all his life. Now, David was a warrior king. He starts his career killing the champion of Gath, Goliath. And he doesn't stop from there. This is even before he's king. He is so good in battle and rallies the troops so well that King Saul actually puts him as a commander over his whole, like, like a battalion, like a general. Over, over a huge troop. And he's a young guy. 
He's a young guy at this time, but he's so good in battle, and the Lord was with him. Now, let's look at this next map. Let's look at this next map. So I, I know it's really small. We'll, we'll zoom in in just a minute. We'll zoom in in just a minute. But the reason I show you this one is it's zoomed out a little bit. You've got it all the way down to the Red Sea at the south, and to the north it goes all the way up past Tyre and Sidon, almost all the way up to the Euphrates River. Not quite. The little brown area at the top is the part that Solomon actually uh, was able to negotiate. He actually was able to bring that under the kingdom in his day, probably through a royal marriage. One of those, however many brides he had, was probably <laughs> to actually win that area over and bring it under the nation of Israel. But when we say that David was a mighty warrior. He went from the tiny little bit of yellow to the entirety of the land that had been promised. He was a mighty warrior. You look at this map. Let's go, down to, the, let's go to the next slide. This shows in the south, just to zoom in a little bit. We can see that he goes all the way down to Elat, or Elath. Uh, and then he's conquered all the way. The, the little blue line to the left is that brook of Egypt. He has completely conquered Amalek. Remember that Ziklag had been taken over by Amalek, and that was the city that David was living in at the time. Obviously, Saul had not done such a good job of wiping out Amalek. And so David goes in, and that's where David says, Lord, are you going to give, give the Amalekites into my hand? They'd already been literally awake for three days. Now, if you've been awake for three days, you start seeing things. Uh, it is just that's the way it is. And so, you know... They, they continue to walk, they chase these guys down, and God gave them all back into their hands. But they rescued all their wives and children. David, uh, David was also, through David, he conquered all of the cities of, of the Philistines. All the cities of the Philistines were, were conquered by David. He also conquers Moab. Now, it was helpful that his, David's mother-in-law, no, um, grandmother, was a lady by the name of Ruth. Now, where was Ruth from? Okay, so when you have a king and your grandmother is from a certain country, they are a little bit more likely to just be like, yeah, we're kin, we're family. So David kind of had these, you know, God-made political marriages. So Moab comes in under Israel. Edom came in under Israel. Ammon was brought in under Israel. All of these were... Uh, subservient states, states under Israel. They paid tribute to David, and David basically protect, protected them, and uh, they prospered, actually. They prospered quite, quite well. So this, we see this, he's conquered all the way up to Philistia. Well, let's go to the next map. That's the northern side. We see that it, there's the Galilee right there, the bottom center. And there's Tyre and Sidon all the way up. I mean, this is, this is a long way up. This is way more than what Israel currently possesses today. All right? Notice Damascus. David controlled Damascus. Syria was conquered by David. So yes, the nation of Aram was conquered all the way up to Kadesh in the north. Now, in, to, in addition to this, he didn't conquer Tyre and Sidon, but he had a really good friendship with the kings of Ty, with the king of Tyre, and that friendship actually continued into uh, into Solomon or to Solomon, uh, specifically King Hiram of Tyre. King Hiram of Tyre was actually it says literally that he was a good friend of David, and uh, David purchased all of the cedars of Lebanon to help build the temple. So they actually he paid him, paid him for all the work, for chopping the wood down, and they floated it down the Mediterranean and then, and then basically brought it in uh, and in, took it over to Jerusalem. So we pick up the story in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Now it came about, when the king, this is King David, lived in his palace, and Adonai had granted him rest from all of his enemies around him, that the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now I am living in a house of cedar, yet the ark of God remains within curtains. 
Go and do all that is in your heart, Nathan said to the king, for Adonai is with you. But that night, we know that Adonai speaks to Nathan. And he states that Nathan, that David, will not build a temple for Adonai. Adonai points out that David, to, to, he says, David, listen, I've never asked for a house. I've lived in a tabernacle over in Shiloh. And now, currently, the, the, the ark had been moved to Jerusalem, but it was in a simple tent. It was just in a tent in Jerusalem. And God says, listen, I never asked for a house. I've never asked for these things. But because David's desire was to build a house for the Lord, Adonai says, because you wanted to build me a house, I'm going to establish your house forever. So let's keep reading down in verse 11. Chapter 7, verse 11. He says, Moreover, Adonai declares to you that Adonai will make a house for you. When your days are done and you sleep with your fathers, I will raise up your seed who will come forth from you after you, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for, me, for my name, and I will establish his royal throne forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. If he commits iniquity, then I will correct him with the rod of men and with the strokes from the sons of men. Yet my loving kindness will not be withdrawn from him as I withdrew it from Saul, whom I removed before you. So your house and your kingship shall be secure forever before you. Your throne will be established forever. Now, how many know what this promise is called? The Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant. So, just as with the other covenants that we've gone over, we'll ask the same question. So, we've got the four questions up there. You know, what type of covenant is this? Who are the participants in this covenant? What are the provisions in this covenant? And what are the results of this covenant? So, the first question. Is this a conditional or an unconditional covenant? Unconditional. God is simply making a promise to David. He says, because your heart was to go after and build me a house, this is what I'm going to do. doesn't say, give, it, give, give any conditions for why he's going to it. In fact, he even says, if your sons sin against me, I'm still not going to remove my favor from them. I will bring correction to them. But I will establish your kingship. This is the next question. How long for? Forever. That'll be, bring back memories of a, a movie by the name of Sandlot. But forever. That's a long time, okay? Forever. So this is the promise. Now, who is the promise with? It was with David and his descendants, his seed, his, his direct descendants. So this is an unconditional covenant, a promise made to David, to his seed, his physical descendants, that they will rule on the throne of David forever. In fact, Adonai repeats it twice in this passage. Now, are there any provisions? Well, we see that the house of David and the kingship of David are secure. Now, David came from what tribe? tribe of Judah. That's right, the tribe of Judah. Now, do you know a people group today that goes by the name of Judah? Okay, that's right. So the Jewish people, the Jewish people, obviously, the name Jew comes from the name Judah. And they became known as the tribe of Judah when they went into captivity in Babylon. And ever since then, they have been known as the Jews or the Jewish people. It is derived from Judah. And so we see the name of the people of Israel ever since that time, ever since the return from Babylon in 538 BC, when Cyrus the Great gave him permission, ever since then has been, they have been known as Jews. So what was David's response? David gets this you know, word from the prophet Nathan and he's astounded. He's amazed. It says he goes into the tent. 
sits next to the Ark of the Covenant. It says it sits next in the presence of Adonai. And let's pick up the story in verse 18. And King David went in and he sat down before Adonai and he says, Who am I, my Lord Adonai, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? Yet this was a small thing in your eyes, my Lord Adonai, for you have spoken of your servant's house for the distant future. This is a revelation for humanity, my Lord Adonai. What more can David add in speaking to you? For you already know your servant, my Lord Adonai. For the sake of your word and according to your own heart, you have done, ev done everything great, revealing this to your servant. Therefore you are great, my Lord Adonai, for there is none like you, and there is no God besides you, as we all have heard with our ears. What one nation on earth is like your people, like Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for himself a name, to do for you a great thing and awesome deeds for your land, before your people, whom you redeemed for for yourself from Egypt, driving out nations and their gods. You establish for yourself your people Israel as your very own people forever, and you, Adonai, have become their God. You notice how many times David's putting it back on God? He's like, you've done this because you, it was all on you. You already know who I am. I'm a broken man. I'm a little shepherd boy. But you've done this because you wanted to do this, because you wanted to raise up a nation, because you had a decision to make. And you decided to do this for your own purposes. Now the reason I bring up this passage, David recognizes that Adonai has promised him something that is a revelation for all of humanity. Now, how many have an NIV? NIV version. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll bet your version doesn't say this is a revelation for all humanity, does it? No, it doesn't. Now, I happen to be in a class by the, uh, the translator of the NIV for 2 Samuel, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Kaiser. Dr. Kaiser. And he told us in the, in the, in the, the, the seminar, or in the teaching, the class I was going to, he said, I told the group, that this is how it should be translated, and they refused to translate it the way I thought it should be translated. They wanted it the way that it is in the NIV. And he says, I told them that if they did that, I would, I would tattle on them. And I do. And so this is actually a more accurate uh, translation than what the NIV has there. That this is a Torah, a law for all of humanity. What David's recognizing is that this covenant includes a lot more than just him. It includes a lot more than just the tribe of Judah. It includes a lot more than just Israel. That this is something that God is doing that is going to benefit all of humanity. He recognizes the covenantal language that's spoken to Abraham that says, in you all the nations of the world will be blessed. And David says, you're doing this because you're fulfilling your word, not because I'm something special. Now let's talk of a son of David. I say a son of David, not the son of David. So Solomon comes along as the son of David and Bathsheba, and we see that he starts out all right. He does go ahead and build the house of the Lord, uh, he builds this house. It's an incredible. He does a lot of uh, architectural building and planning. But we've got to remember David had been collecting gold and silver and precious things and basically stockpiling it because it, although he was not allowed to build it, he certainly was allowed to prepare for it. We pick up the story in 1 Kings 5. 1 Kings chapter 5, starting at verse 15. Then King Hiram of Tyre sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him as king in place of his father. For Hiram was always a friend of David. 
So Solomon sent word to Hiram and said, You know how my father David could not build a house for the name of Adonai, his God, because of the wars around him on every side, until Adonai put them under the soles of my feet. But now Adonai, my God, has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor bad incident. So behold, I intend to build a house for the name of Adonai, my God, as Adonai spoke to my father David, saying, Your son, whom I will set upon your throne in your place, he will build a house for my name. So now, command that they cut cedars from Lebanon for me. My servants will be with your servants, and I will give you wages for your servants, according to whatever you say. For as you know, there, are no, there is none among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. Now when Hiram heard Solomon's words, he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be Adonai today, who has given to David a wise son over this great people. So Hiram sent word to Solomon, saying, I've heard your message that you've sent to me. I will do all you desire concerning the cedar, and the cypress, and the lumber. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon to the sea, and I will make them into rafts to go by the sea to the place that you indicate to me. And there I will break them up, and you will carry them away. Then you will accomplish my desire by giving food for my household. So Hiram kept providing Solomon with cedar, cypress, timber, as much as he desired. Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures of wheat for food for his household and 20 measures of beaten oil. Thus, Solomon would give to Hiram year by year. Adonai gave Solomon wisdom as he had promised him. And so there was shalom between Hiram and Solomon. And the two of them cut a covenant. They cut a covenant. See, that's what's supposed to happen. When you have a strong king ruling in Israel, he's supposed to be a strong, wise king. Solomon's response to King Hiram was very positive. It was, nobody cuts trees down like the Sidonians. He didn't threaten. He didn't do any of that. No, he praised him and says, listen, not only that, I want to pay you. I don't want to pay you whatever you say I Whatever, you, whatever price you offer or say, let's go into a really good deal. Because I need a lot of wood. We've got a lot of building to do. And you guys are the best loggers that I know around. And so they actually cut a covenant. The reason I bring this passage up is we see that the relationship that David had had with Hiram continues on throughout the entire reign of Solomon. Now, we're not going to look much more into Solomon. Except to note from the map, if you can go back to the, the map that shows the little brown area right at the top again. It's the one that's zoomed out. Let's see. Yeah, that's the one. What the scriptures say is that Solomon secured all the land from the Euphrates all the way down to the river of Egypt. We see this in 1 Kings chapter 4. So just one chapter before where we had read, and we'll look at verse 20. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea in abundance, eating and drinking and rejoicing. Now Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the river, that's the river Euphrates, to the land of the Philistines up to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and they served Solomon all the days of his life. And then it goes through and explains just how much wealth was pouring into the nation. I want to quote from Richard Patterson. He says this. Let's go to the quote. He says, Solomon's kingdom was a peaceful and prosperous one, with control over all the kingdoms west of the Euphrates. Solomon was able to provide peace and security for his people. The statement is that each man sat under his own vine and fig tree. This speaks of an undisputed prosperity, and it became a favorite catchphrase which is used by the prophets to point to the ideal conditions prevailing in Messiah's future kingdom. There's this snapshot in time of what the perfect messianic kingdom looks like. The kingdom of David, in particular, of the David created 
but that Solomon ruled in peace and prosperity with wisdom. The reason that I bring this up is look at the two verses, Micah 4.4 4 and Zechariah 3.10. A little bit later in Micah, just about two chapters later in Micah, there's this interesting prophecy about how there's going to be a star born in a little town, Bethlehem of Ephrata. A little star, a Messiah that's coming. And in Zechariah, a little bit later in Zechariah, Zechariah starts talking of how they will look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for their only begotten son. These, are mass, these prophets have massive uh, contributions to who the Messiah is going to be and what Israel is going to look like in the future. But we're going to now switch over to the archaeological evidence. I like archaeological evidence, as I say each week. I really do. Last week, I mentioned that we were going to talk about giants. This is for the kids. <clears throat> so all you kids, you can now pay attention. God's, is there any evidence of giants in the land? That's a good question. It's hard because, you know, sometimes, you know, rags and rocks and there's just not much left over. And obviously, David probably did exactly what he said he would do to... Uh, you know, Goliath, he probably left his body out there to be eaten by the birds, which means there probably wasn't much left over. I don't know if you guys have dogs or something and you give them a bone and trust me, there's nothing left over once the dogs get at the bones, right? So that's just the reality. We, do we have any bones? Well, what we have is actually interesting. Let's go to the first slide. We have giant spearheads. Giant spearheads. Now, the one on the left hand is a, is a recreation because, of course, the ones on the right hand are, are in the Israel Museum. All right? Now, these are really big spearheads. The shortest one, which is letter C, is 33 centimeters long. That's a really big spearhead. Okay, that's a big... Spearheads were normally, you know, about 10 centimeters long. Okay? But these are really big... And the longest one over there is 66 centimeters long. That's a big spearhead. It happens to be, it happens to weigh about two kilos of bronze. Two, two kilograms. Now, that's not including the wood. We know from the description in 1 Samuel 17 verse 7 that the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. And the shield bearer was marching ahead of him. Now, 600 shekels is a little bit bigger. Let's go back to the previous slide. 600 shekels is about seven and a half kilos. So it's about, what, two, three times that size. That's a big spear. Now, I actually, because <laughs> I'm an engineer, I said, well, what's the density of, <laughs> of bronze to iron? And it actually turns out the bronze is actually a little more dense than iron. So there you go. Even though iron can be turned into steel, which is harder, uh, bronze was used earlier. Now these spearheads were discovered in 1962 in Kafar Monash, which is up a little bit north. And uh, they, they were brought down into the Israel Museum. And as you can see, there are, on the big one especially, up around near the top, you can see there's divots in it, nicks, uh, and you can look at the points. The points have actually been blunted because these spearheads show signs of use. Now, that's a little bit awkward because the prevailing atheistic perspective is they must have just been for show because they're too big for a person to use, so they must have been just for show because they don't want to believe in giants. Well, I'm just saying... Why then is there evidence of use? It has been used. And so, the, uh, the atheistic archaeologists, they try to claim that uh, just for decoration. But because there is evidence of use, that kind of throws a wrench in their gears, and they're just not quite sure. So on the left-hand side, <coughs> you can see there's a recreation they did at the Creation Museum in the U.S., based upon the measurements of the, the larger one. Uh, and the, the, the size of a weaver beam is, you know, they, they say about two inches in diameter. So that's a, two inches is what? Seven, seven centimeters, give or take? No, what is it? Two and a half? Five. Five, five centimeters? So five centimeters diameter 
And uh, yeah, sorry, my conversion is yeah English to metric, but no, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But I, you know, these are the things I like. But the, see, that's a big spear. And the reason you have to have it that big is otherwise it's not balanced. Otherwise, it's front heavy. It has to be that long because otherwise it, it doesn't fly straight. Okay, it's, it's that simple. But that's a big spear. That is a big, big spear. Now, also, what they found at the same location where they found these spears, go to the next slide, were these metal scales. Metal scales. A lot of metal scales. Now, that's interesting. Now, what on earth could metal scales have to do with a really big spear? Well, it says in 1 Samuel 17, verse 5, that Goliath had a bronze helmet on his head and a breastplate of scale armor. It's a breastplate of scale armor. Um, of course, the, go, back to the, go back to the picture. The, the, the current explanation, or the, the, there must have been multiple breastplates because that's way too many for one person to carry around on him. That's one perspective. If you don't believe in giants and you don't believe the Bible, I, yeah, I could see how you could come to that conclusion. But I think that your bias is biasing you away from a, an interesting, obvious, simpler explanation that this was a giant's breastplate. A giant's breastplate. Similar to the one that the giant had. Now, sh uh, scales like this was, was found in one other interesting place. Can you guess what city that the scales were also found in? Nope. It was close. Gath. Yeah, Gath. Well, it was pretty close. I mean, it's one of the Philistine cities, right? So absolutely, Gath. They're also found in Gath. All right. So this is just, you talk of evidence for giants. I think that's about as good as you're going to get. Uh, you know, there's, like I said, there's not many photos that were taken back then, so it's just kind of hard to, to picture it, but this would be what a giant would wear for breastplates. Let's go to the next slide. How about some evidence for the house of David? Sorry, next slide with that has a picture. Let's talk of the house of David. Okay. Up in Tel Dan, Tel Dan is the archaeological site of the city of Dan, we found this. Next slide. There's an interesting rock with some words carved into it. And like I've said, finding words from the ancient world is extremely rare. But right in here, and it's kind of highlighted in white, it literally states the house of David. Now, this, this stele uh, was actually written, uh, we believe, by most probably Hazel, the king of, of Syria or Assyria. And he was talking about how he had, uh, you know, was fighting against the house of David, right? That he wasn't really good friends with David. Obviously not. Now, the house of David came to be known, you know, colloquially as, you know, the entire descendants and lineage of David. So this stele actually comes from a, a few years later. But nonetheless, this is the earliest evidence of the house of David, written in stone. The last one that I want to show, and this one's just for fun. What do you think those round rocks are? Oh my goodness is right. So these are round rocks that are sling stones. Now the sling is new. They, because slings don't last, they're made out of animal material, so they don't last. So we don't have any slings from back at that time frame. But the rocks themselves, based upon where they found the rocks, uh, they estimate that they come from around 701 B.C. Now, it's not quite as old as David, but nonetheless, that's a decent-sized rock. I don't know. These, these rocks, they fit in your hand about like this. It's like a snowball, but made out of rock. Now... Here's the cool thing, and this is, I like the technical side of things. So, you know the big spear that we showed earlier? Well, being that a giant can probably throw further than a regular person, that spear could probably fly almost 20 to 30 meters. So, a giant could chuck that spear 20 to 30 meters. That's a pretty decent throw. Uh, now, I didn't measure in here, but that's, 
you know, that's probably the, what is, you think, the width of the room? 20 to 30 meters? Give or take. Give or take. That's a decent, that's a decent distance. But how far do you think sling stones can fly? About 40 meters. And how fast do you think that they fly? Any guesses? Just throw out some guesses. How fast do you think it's... I see a hand over there, yes? Yes, as fast as a tornado. Now, how fast does a tornado go? Hundred and eighty. Man, you're smack dab on the number. One hundred and eighty-two kilometers per hour. Now that's fast. <laughs> that is fast. One hundred and eighty-two kilometers per hour. A rock the size of a snowball flying at one hundred and eighty-two, and it can go forty meters. And uh, by the way, those who threw sling stones were known for their accuracy. David actually had an entire troop who were the sling stoners. Right? They, that was their designation. And uh, they were feared because this went further than arrows. And this had more punch than arrows had. And they were just as accurate. And so, yeah, what we're basically saying is, is it possible, conceivable, that David, a younger man, could sling a stone and hit the giant before the giant was able to throw a spear and hit him? Yes. There you go. There you go. So that's, I know, I love that sort of stuff. So there's, there's, you can go see these sorts of things in Israel. There's tons of great stuff in, um, at the Israel Museum. Let's wrap it up in conclusion. To conclude this, I want to ask you a simple question. How big is your God? How big is your God? And what I mean by this, do you really believe that God is powerful? Do you believe that God is active in the world? Do you believe that he is everywhere? Do you believe that he is with you? I ask this seriously because we read how Adonai used these three kings, David, Saul, and Solomon, to establish the land of Israel from the river Euphrates to the river of Egypt. Now we've also read... Last week, how he removed his protection from the land of Israel under the time of the judges. And here's a question. Does Adonai still do this today? Now, I've wrestled with the events of October the 7th. Now, I have come to the conclusion that Adonai allowed the attack of the terrorists for several reasons. One of the biggest reasons is found in Deuteronomy chapter 32. I mentioned it briefly earlier with regards to the song of Moses. And what's interesting is that I've been wrestling this for weeks, months actually, ever since my wife showed me a photo of a massive idol that was set up at the Nova Festival. Now that idol was called the Nova Idol. Do you know what Nova means? New. It was a new idol. In Deuteronomy 32, God specifically says that if you go after other gods and worship them, gods that you have not known, new idols. And he continues. He says, then I will cause one of your enemies to chase a thousand of you to flight. I will raise up a nation that is not a nation, a foolish nation. And they will kill young and old alike, men and women, babes and gray beards together. They will take your children. And I've read this and I've read this and I've prayed through it. I've prayed through it with uh, different groups um, and I'm still wrestling with it. But that God would take the Palestinian nation, which is not a nation, Hamas, a foolish nation, and would allow them, such a small number of them, to run wild on October the 7th with nobody fighting against them for hours. And then I read Deuteronomy 32. 
And God says, this is what's going to happen if you go after other gods. It's come out recently that, um, that actually they were planning an attack, but it was going to be closer to Passover. The question is, why did they do it sooner? Well, specifically, they did it because of the Nova Festival. So why did God allow it? And I would say it's because of the Nova Festival. Because of the idolatry. And it's not just idolatry. I know every time I see pictures of the, the kids that died on that day, all I can see are pictures of my kids. It breaks my heart. And I, was, I was talking to my cousin yesterday. And he said, yeah, it's always, sorry, it's always so sad, but it is the children who pay the price for nations and adults who sin against God. It doesn't matter which nation it is. It can be, it can be in North Africa where, where you see the nations ravaged by war. Who pays the price? The kids who are conscripted into these armies to fight. Who pays the price? Our children pay the price. I remember a quote from Abraham Lincoln. And he said, very clearly in the middle of the Civil War, he says, we are paying for slavery with the blood of our sons on the battlefield. He understood the direct connection that God was visiting his chastisement onto a nation. Now, I've been studied, you know, wrestling with this for, for months. And I just did a search. I did a search online, and I found this, um, found this gentleman on this little... His, his name is Doran Schneider. Doran Schneider. I recommend you... To con I'll, uh, I'll give you guys a link. You can just search it up. Just search him up. He has his website in his name. He's a Messianic Jew. I'd never heard of him before. He lives in Tel Aviv. He's German. Uh, he speaks German and writes German fluently which makes, puts me to shame. He's trilingual because his English is way better than my German or my Hebrew. But he writes this about the prophecies of October the 7th, and he comes to the exact same conclusion. The exact same passages in, in Deuteronomy 32. You go read it for yourself. I don't have time to read it all right now. But as with every prophecy, God always finishes with hope. And he finishes, he says, ultimately this is an epic battle between good and evil, between light and darkness. The devil strives with all his might to destroy Israel in the hope of preventing the return of Jesus. For he knows perfectly well that Jesus will not return until all the Jews have returned to their homeland. According to Zechariah 12 verse 10. Jesus will reveal himself to his people only then. Much like Joseph, who revealed himself to his brothers only after all of his brothers were standing before him. For this reason, although God is very angry with his chosen people, he will not allow such a thing to happen. And so, all, and so his enemies, who are driven by the devil, will not be able to claim our hand was raised up again. What it says, in, if you read Deuteronomy 32, God specifically says, listen, I'm going to let them come in and they will bring you punishment, but I'm not going to let them win. Otherwise, they're going to say that their own strength and their own might actually did this instead of me. But God says, how could one of them chase a thousand of you to flight unless your rock, me, unless I had abandoned you? A handful of terrorists chased the 3,000 celebrating Israelis at the festival. And the rest of the terrorists chased approximately 10,000 residents in the confined villages of the Gaza Strip. But I want to finish just with the, the bit of the story of the hope. Anyone who has a long enough memory. Do you guys remember how many elections Israel went through in the last five years? They've been through like six or seven elections in the last five years. Normally they're like us, they have one every three years, but they literally, the, the government was falling apart all the time. 
They were on the verge of civil war. There were protests everywhere. I don't know if you remember this. You know, people were throwing punches and, and they're, you know, doing all sorts of stuff, burning stuff. Every, all of that stuff was happening right before. And he says, we are now amazed by the enormous unity in Israel society that has prevailed throughout the people since that brutal attack on October the 7th. It is astonishing and at the same time encouraging to observe how many secular Israelis have turned back to God since October the 7th attack. Even many non-religious soldiers pray daily before they go into battle against Hamas. Just as God promised, on the one hand, He will retaliate against the enemies of Israel for their deeds, but on the other hand, He will bring reconciliation to His land and to His people Israel. Already today, a beginning of this reconciliation can be felt in society, which gives us hope for the imminent return of our Lord Jesus. Am Israel Chai. Uh, I'm excited because I, my prayers have changed. We can pray for the protection of Israel, and that's not bad. But if you notice, we don't give God rest until He establishes it. Now, how has He said He's going to establish? Exactly what we're seeing before us. So what we need to pray for is repentance. It's the same thing we, we think, we, the same thing we need as a nation. We need to pray that people would return to Yeshua. For is, there is no other name under heaven or on earth by which men can be saved. And so let's pray. When we pray for Israel, we're going to go to prayer right now. I'm just going to close in prayer. We're going to pray for Israel that they simply return to God. Because then it's on God's shoulders to, defect, to protect Israel. Right? And He is faithful. Father, We have seen you, we have seen your anger, but it is for, but for a moment. But Lord, we are now asking for you to comfort, comfort your people, to bring comfort and return. Lord, and Lord, as we pray, we pray, Lord, that the people of Israel would turn to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their Messiah, Yeshua of Nazareth through whom there is forgiveness. Father, I pray, I pray, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to every person, man, woman, and child in Israel. Because then, Lord, you will rise up. You will defend. And Lord, we pray the same for this nation of Australia. Lord, we pray that we as a nation would repent truly turn back to you. We pray in Yeshua's name. Amen.